Welcome back everybody to another lecture here in History 1302 and the topic today that we'll be covering is that of the American Gilded Age. Now last time we were in class we talked about the end of the American Civil War and how it, it or how after that conflict we saw the shaping of Reconstruction. However, coinciding alongside the beginning of Reconstruction we also see this new period that of the American Gilded Age. Now the Gilded Age, what we'll see is it's going to be characterized by a rapid industrialization that was caused by the Civil War. During the Civil War, we saw that American industry was beginning to build mainly for the war effort. However, after the Civil War, that industry will only continue to expand. However, rather than producing war materials, it would be producing commercial products or industrial goods. And today we're gonna to be focusing on that rapid industrialization that only continues after the Civil War. Now, what brings about this industrialization? Well, one, it will be the war effort during the Civil War, but it's also going to be because we'll witness a major railway boom. Really, the only reason we see industrialization take place is because of the fact the nation begins to build up its railways uh, significantly. Over the course of the latter portion of the 1800s, we'll see that there will be some 200,000 miles of railways that would be constructed all across the nation. And why is that so important for industrialization? Well, not only will these railways become the first big businesses to have, um, have stocks on, say, Wall Street, and but what we will also see is with these railways, they're going to connect the nation like never before. They're going to open up new market new markets and they are going to allow for the quick transportation of goods and so that will be very crucial eventually for establishing rapid industrialization and rapid economic growth now from these railways as we start to see this railway boom begin to take on we'll see that the uh, railways will employ hundreds of thousands of workers and they would effectively become the first big businesses that we see emerge in american history and we'll also see that these railways, like other industries that we'll talk about a little bit later on, they will begin to monopolize, to try to cut out competition to maximize profits. Now, starting with railway companies, we'll see that they would form the first big businesses or major corporations that would come to dominate respective industries. And also with many of these big businesses, including the railways, and we'll talk about later on the steel as well as the oil industry, we'd see that they would begin to monopolize, to cu cut out competition. Now, what a monopoly basically is, is where we see a bunch of smaller companies join together to create one larger company, to control prices to where they could set them at will and maximize their profits. Now, how these monopolies are going to be created during the uh, Gilded Age uh, is they'll have to go around interstate commerce laws. And how they're going to do this is we'll see that they're going to rely on legal entities known as trusts, to where several smaller companies would elect a board, i.e. an individual, to where they would begin to set policies for each one of these companies, i.e. things like setting prices and so on and so forth. And as a result, we'll see that with the rise of railways, as well as other big businesses, we'll also see the rise of monopolies. And during this period, these monopolies are only going to be interested in generating profit. And this is going to contribute to why during the Gilded Age, we're going to see a traumatic growth within the wealth gap. Basically, what's going to happen is with the rise of these big businesses, these monopolies, we're going to see that the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. The wealth is not going to be evenly distributed. And it will largely be because of those who will run these monopolies, that of the captains of industries or known to their critics as the robber barons. Now, in regards to the captains of industry or these robber barons, there's quite literally going to be hundreds, if not maybe a, few, a couple thousand of them during this period. These are going to be essentially America's first millionaires who are going to take advantage of the rapidly industrializing nation to benefit their own wealth. Now, these robber barons, while the Gilded Age is going to be characterized by innovation, where we start to see electric uh, electricity be used in the mainstream and where we see other uh, innovations begin to be introduced, they're not going to be inventors like a Thomas Edison or a Nikola Tesla who emerged during this period, but rather they're really just going to be managers. They are going to look to their respective industries and they're going to attempt to try to maximize production. So that way they can maximize their profits and enhance their wealth. 
Now, we're not going to talk about the hundreds of robber barons that would ultimately make millions during this period, but rather we're going to focus on the few industrial giants that are going to uh, dominate their respective industries. And the uh, three individuals that I'm really going to point out today is going to be that of John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, as well as J.P. Morgan. So talking about these three industrial giants, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Morgan, we'll see that they're not only going to come to dominate their respective industries, but they will become household names and dominate much of the American, um, or much of America's assets during the Gilded Age. Now, I'm not going to have a relatively lengthy biography about each one, but I just wanted to go through each one and talk about what they are going to do that's going to be either innovative or that's going to drastically change how these big businesses function. Now, first, John D. Rockefeller. He, as well as Carnegie, they're going to be, or they're going to epitomize what we would recognize today as the American dream. They're going to start from nothing, and eventually they're going to rise to something, eventually acquiring millions during their lifetime. Now, Rockefeller himself, he's going to come to dominate the oil industry. Now, during the uh, 1860s and the 1870s, after he had served as a, uh, first as a low-level um, uh, uh, clerk within uh, Cleveland and eventually rising his way up to be a factory owner, he's going to invest in the oil industry. Now during the Gilded Age, this is before the invention of the automobile, and so oil, while it wasn't used for say cars like we use it today, it was used for other products and it could reach a variety of American consumers. Most notably oil would be used in kerosene uh, lanterns that were still used all across the nation. And so he would look to dominate this industry because he could make massive pro uh, profits by appealing to many American consumers. Now, he's going to employ two forms of um, business practices to try to monopolize and centralize the oil industry to where he virtually controls all the oil supply within the nation. Now, the first one that he would be uh, characterized with is going to be that of horizontal expansion. With horizontal expansion, what Rockefeller is basically going to do is as his company gets larger and as he gets more wealthier, he's going to begin to buy out other companies. So that way he can merge them with his larger company, Standard Oil, to where he could dominate the oil industry and ultimately set prices. We'll also see later on that he would employ what's known as vertical integration or vertical expansion, which would first be introduced by Andrew Carnegie to where he would look to control all modes of production within his industry. And from here, he would basically control almost 90% of the nation's oil supply by the time we get to 1900. And as you can probably guess, oil, a very important commodity, is going to make him millions. And he will become one of the richest men, not only in American history, but in world history because of this. Next, we have Andrew Carnegie. Now, he will be characterized as uh, putting forth that vertical integration method I mentioned a moment ago, and he has a very similar background to Rockefeller. Actually, our Andrew Carnegie, we'll see he would be an immigrant who would arrive over from Scotland when he was a young, um, when he was a, uh, a young individual, and like Rockefeller, he would rise throughout the ranks. He would first start off as an average operator within a, um, within a factory and eventually come to own the factory. And during the Panic of 1873, he sees an opportunity present itself to where he could get involved in the growing steel industry. Now, the steel industry it was very important because, remember, we were experiencing this railway boom. And to help fuel the expansion of these railways, you need steel. And as a result, Carnegie saw an industry to where he could make his millions. And he would quickly build up what would become known as Carnegie Steel, first using vertical integration to control all modes of production in regards to the steel industry to expand. And eventually he would have one of the largest steel corporations in the nation by 1900. And like Rockefeller, would acquire a great amount of wealth during his life. Now the last of the robber barons that I'm going to mention is going to be that of J.P. Morgan. Now the industry he's going to come to dominate is going to be the banks. He's going to dominate the banking industry, which was crucial for the rise of many of these businesses. Now, unlike Carnegie or Rockefeller, Morgan is going to be born into wealth. His father was a wealthy banker, and just like his father, he himself would also become a banker 
to who would heavily invest in American businesses. Now, he will get European investors to invest into, say, railway companies or other American uh, uh, companies. And here, he's going to look to consolidate these companies to not only maximize the uh, profits that his investors would make, but maximize his own profits. Now, Morgan, as well as the rest of these robber barons, they are going to disdain competition. Because with more competition, this means lower prices, and it means lower profits for these businesses. And so as a result, with Morgan, as well as these other individuals, they would look to create those monopolies, and they will condense their respective industries to where they dominate them. Now, all of them are going to disdain competition, as my little screen goes out, see if I can get it back up, there we go. But anyways, they're all going to disdain competition, and they're going to employ very brutal methods to stomp out their uh, competition. In the case of Rockefeller, what we'll see is that in some cases, he would actually take a year to where he would lose profits by lowering prices so much that his, the, his, the uh, other rival oil companies would run out of business. And similar methods would also be employed by both Carnegie and Morgan. This was so that way their companies would be the only ones on the block and they could control almost entirely their respective businesses. And as a result, we'll see that each one of these individuals will control either between 80 to 90 percent of their industries. And in the case of Morgan, he's going to control much of the money supply that's going to be invested into these companies. And as he consolidates these companies, he's also growing to grow his own fortune. Now, with that said, Morgan will become the most powerful man in America because directly or indirectly, he's going to control 40% of the nation's assets. To put that into perspective, if you were to look around, he would control 40% of everything you see around you in your communities. That's an overwhelming amount of power. And he has the power to where if he wanted to, with the snap of his fingers, he could either shut down or save the economy. And on two separate occasions, he would step in to save the U.S. economy. And that's eventually going to be when we'll start to see Americans are going to want to re recreate a bank of the United States to take this power away from one individual. Now, as these individuals begin to stomp out competition and as they begin to amass large fortunes, what we're going to see is that they are also going to create a very cozy relationship with politicians. Because since they have all the money, they can basically buy out those politicians' votes and with it dictate policy. Now, they will create a very cozy relationship with both major political parties, but in particular what we'll see is they would be in the pocketbooks of the Republican Party. Now, after a Reconstruction comes to a close, most Republicans are going to begin to distance themselves not only from Reconstruction policies, policies, but also from the issue of civil rights. And with it, they're going to begin to promote big businesses. And in particular, they're going to promote protectionism. They're going to create tariffs during this period to protect these American businesses. Because a big threat was, uh, was uh, foreign businesses, especially from Great Britain or also over in, um, or other countries over in Europe. Now, why was this the case? Well, it's because when we see many of these foreign uh, companies begin to import goods into the U.S., they were often at cheaper prices compared to their American competitors. And as a result, you as a consumer, if you see an identical product, one that is a British-made product, and one that's an American-made product, and the British-made product is a little bit cheaper, you're probably going to buy the cheaper product. And if you do that, you're not investing into American companies. And if you don't invest into American companies, they will end up failing. As a result, to try to counter this, this is where Congress is going to adopt tariffs to apply them to those British imported goods. So that way it raises their prices to where they're just a little bit less or a little bit more than the American goods. And as a result, if the American product was cheaper now for you, you're more inclined to purchase that, giving the money to these companies. And we'll see that that would be the mainstream, um, uh, mainstream policies that, um, that the Republicans would promote during this period. Now, the Democrats themselves will also see that they are going to be in the pocketbooks of these big businesses. And despite the fact that they are going to see, be seen at times as the Reform Party during this period, they're going to practice a laissez-faire approach to government. The Republicans will as well, to where they're not going to institute any sort of regulations against these big businesses. And so this will come at the expense of the laborers, and we'll talk about it a little bit later on, because the rights that will be protected will be these big businesses, and this is only going to lead to an increase within the wealth gap. And we'll talk more about that here in just a second. 
Now, for many Americans, especially these robber barons, they would state that this was the natural position of demo or not democracy of progress within the nation. That in order for the nation to continue to advance, to continue to progress, they needed to allow for this growth within the wealth gap, a growth within inequality. And to justify this, what we'll see is that these big businesses, as well as other individuals in American society, are going to subscribe to a belief known as social Darwinism. Now, what social Darwinism is, is it's basically justifying the mass inequality that we see around the nation during the Gilded Age. What social Darwinism and where it derives its arguments from is from Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. To where in a nutshell, if you look at the theory of evolution, according to Charles Darwin, we go from single-celled organisms all the way to the complex beings that we are today. He also promotes within his uh, arguments in his theory of the evolution that it was the survival of the fittest that got us to this point where we're at. And we'll see that that idea, the survival of the fittest, they're going to take it and apply it to the social atmosphere. And through social Darwinism, they would state that it really was a fight for the survival of the fittest within American society. And that the reason the people like uh, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and Morgan, the reason they were on top was because they were the fittest individuals in society. They had the right characteristics. And through this, they would also state that if you were poor, if you were an average American who was not making a high wage, well, you were in that position because of some sort of character flaw. And therefore, you were not fit enough to, uh, to uh, rise up within society. Well, this argument completely neglects the, um, the stance of average Americans that the reason they can't advance socially wasn't because they uh, could not, um, wasn't because they weren't ambitious enough. It was simply because they lacked the means to gain education or other means to socially advance. Because half the time they're going to be working almost their entire uh, week. We'll see that they'd be uh, forced to work 12 hour days and sometimes 60 plus hour weeks and work for wages that were so low they had to have all members of their household contribute to going off to working in a factory just so they could survive. And I do think it's important for us to recognize with this growing wealth gap, with the lack of government regulation, there is no minimum wage. So companies could quite literally pay their employees as little as possible. However, nonetheless, many are going to subscribe to this belief of social Darwinism to explain why the nation was progressing as it was. However, for many, this was not a good enough answer. And we'll see that laborers, even though they didn't have politicians on their sides, they won't have the courts on their sides. And even, the, even with this uh, new idea spreading to justify this mass inequality, they will have one significant weapon during this period to try to get their grievances heard. And we'll see that they are going to look to um, employ mainly the strike. Now, as we start to see theories like the theory of social Darwinism become widely popular, especially amongst America's ruling elite, basically the top 10%, the rest of American society are not going to agree with that policy. And they believe somewhere in the nation's development, this idea of progress had gone drastically awry. And they were starting to believe that at this point, the idea of Jeffersonian democracy, to where there should be no government intervention, that idea was outdated. And they believe that the only way to achieve true freedom in the long run will be to um, acquire Hamiltonian means of federal government, to have an active government. Because with the lack of government regulation, it led to poor living conditions, it led to, uh, uh, it led to relatively low wages, it led to um, also uh, harsh working conditions as well, as well as a variety of other issues. Now, in this period, before we start to see politics begin to change to adopt that Hamiltonian means of government, we will see that many of those frustrated with the system are going to take matters into their own hands and begin to conduct strikes. Now, first off, in regards to labor during this period, as we had seen with the robber barons, as they were acquiring more and more wealth, it came at the expense of these laborers. Now, by this point in American history, almost the majority of Americans were becoming wage earners. They were either working in a factory or working for some form of company. And with a lack of regulation, they're not going to be paid real, uh, really any high wages. Because remember, there is no minimum wage. They technically could be paid as little as the company desires. And so because of these poor wages, it's to no surprise, and poor working conditions, it's to no surprise that during this period, we will see hundreds of strikes occur from American laborers. 
Now, the first of these strikes would be that of the Great Railway Strike that begins in 1877. And it's really the first nationwide strike to where we'll see hundreds of thousands of workers look to shut down the uh, American economy. And while it will end in failure, we will see it will have a lasting legacy. Because over the course of really the next uh, almost century, we'll see that there would be a continued struggle between the capital class, meaning those elites, and the laboring classes. Now, shortly after we see the, um, the failure of the Great Railway Strike of 1877, we'll also see that laborers, as they were conducting their strikes, they will begin to organize, to form into labor unions to where they could coordinate strikes and coordinate negotiations to try to get better working conditions. And the first of these national labor unions that begins to take shape is going to be that of the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor, while they are a new national organization, it is important for us to recognize that labor unions were nothing new to American history. Ever since the beginning of American manufacturing at the beginning of 18, the 1800s, we saw that American workers had begun to organize. However, we do start to see that by the 1870s and the 1880s, more national organizations are going to begin to form. And we'll see one of those was the Knights of Labor. Now with the Knights of Labor, they're going to be a very radical organization. They're not only going to call on their workers to organize and also strike, but they're also going to subscribe in many ways to some radical ideologies. Most notably, the uh, popular uh, radical ideology that we'll see with the uh, Knights of Labor organization is going to be that of this uh, idea known as anarchism. Now anarchism, it's really a European idea that will arrive with some of the European groups that begin to arrive in the U.S. during this period. It calls for basically an abolition of the federal state because these individuals believe that because of the lack of regulation, it was the federal state's fault for this lack of progress. Well, obviously this is contradictory because without a federal state you can't issue regulation, but these will be members within this group. And they will be very violent and very militant in their approach to strikes. Now there will be a strike that occurs in, 1880, um, in 1886 that would eventually lead to the downfall of the Knights of Labor, and it will be with that of the um, a Haymarket riot that occurs within Chicago. And over time, we'll see many Americans are going to view this group as too radical. And it will begin to grow unpopular as we enter the late 1880s and beginning of the 1890s. However, as this organization begins to collapse, we'll see that another one would ultimately fill its place. However, it would be more conservative, conservative in its approach to these strikes as well as negotiations. And that organization would be that of the American Federation of Labor. Now, the American Federation of Labor, or I'll simply just call it the AFL, the AFL is going to be a much more conservative organization in its approach. They're not necessarily going to look for all workers to join their ranks. We'll see that they would be open to only to skilled laborers as opposed to unskilled laborers. And we'll also see a part of the AFL, they're going to be more willing to try to negotiate to resolve their issues. However, even with this more conservative approach, we'll continue to see that organizations are going to organize and form strikes. There will be a strike that would occur at um, the uh, Homestead uh, Steel Mills for, er, that were a part of Carnegie Steel Company in 1892. And we'll also see that there would be another major strike that occurs in Pullman, Illinois uh, in 1894. All of them over issues pertaining to low wages as well as workers' grievances. And unfortunately for the workers, even when they have the help of whether it's the American Federation of Labor or another labor organization, they would ultimately fail. And this will be the case with many uh, of these labor disputes. However, some will be successful and we will see some grievances, some wages would be raised. But during the Gilded Age, with the lack of an active federal government, that won't really occur. However, during the following era, during the progressive era, we will see that there will be a more active federal government and they would take the side of the strikers on um, several occasions. Now, before I wrap up the, uh, our discussion of uh, capital versus labor, we'll also see that during these strikes, there would be another ideology that would begin to emerge that Americans in time will see as very popular, but eventually will see it as a very radical ideology. And it would be that of socialism. Now, socialism itself, it will become more popular once we get to the progressive era, but it will emerge by the end of the 1890s. And you can make the argument even before that. But it becomes popular um, by the 1890s, but it's going to be a toned back version of socialism. Now with socialism itself, it calls for the, um, it calls for private enterprise to hand over, in, uh, hand over ownership of industry to the public 
to put it in a public trust so it could be publicly owned. This way that, or, so that way there was a more even distribution of the wealth. Now many Americans in time are gonna find this re really radical. However, we will see that individuals like Eugene Debs are going to make sure that it applies to their democratic principles. And they want to see socialism not rise by say a violent revolution to what we see back over in Europe, but rather see it rise through the democratic process. However, it will take time for Americans to begin to turn around to this version of socialism. And by the time they do, we will see that it will become very closely associated with communism. And I do want to point out there is a big difference, but it will become closely associated with communism. And by 1920, we'll see that it, like anarchism, will become unpopular in the US. But anyways, that's a topic for the future. And we'll talk more about socialism when we do get to the progressive era. But for now, we're going to go ahead and end our discussion over the Gilded Age, but we will continue to discuss its themes and how industrialization is not only going to impact American workers in, say, the Northeast, but we'll see how it will impact the American South as well as the West. But we'll talk about that in some future lectures. But anyways, that brings us to the end of this lecture. And on that note, make sure that in the meantime, before you watch the next lecture, that you go out and complete all outstanding assignments, read all the chapters in the textbook, as well as any readings for the week. Um, but anyways, with that said, if you do have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out. But anyways, everybody go out, be safe, and I'll see you all in the next lecture.